Welcome to the 70th episode of the New Ventures podcast. I am your host, Sanjoy Sanyal, the founder of Regain Paradise, a boutique climate finance firm and a visiting fellow at the Cambridge Judge Business School. Along with my co-host, Professor Jaydeep Prabhu, I host this series to understand the link between climate change and food security. Hi, everyone. I'm Jaydeep Prabhu. I'm a professor of marketing at Cambridge Judge Business School. My area of interest is innovation, particularly frugal innovation, how organizations in the public and private sector do more and better with less. Our guest for today is Ambika Hiranandani, the Regulatory and Partnership Specialist of Senara, which is developing cell-based milk. Welcome, Ambika. Hi, Jyoti Tanjay. Thank you so much for having me. Ambika, it's always wonderful to host a Cambridge alum. Could you tell us a bit about yourself? Yeah, of course. First of all, thank you for having me. And of course, Cambridge was an amazing experience where I got to meet fantastic people like you and then do great podcasts like this one. I think when I introduce myself, it's always so confusing because I've actually worn so many hats in my life. I began as a lawyer and I mainly worked on public interest litigation. So, you know, like when to explain it to people who, who don't know very much about the law, I always uh, reference the movie Erin Brockovich. And I'm like, do you remember her like running around trying to get evidence going after the big bad guys? And that's pretty much what I did for the environment and for animals for um, over a decade after which I used my skills in advocacy and I worked with the Tata Trust, you know, and the Zim Premji Philanthropy Initiative where we work for under trial prisoners. And then after that, I started working with the Good Food Institute. And the Good Food Institute actually worked in the novel food space where they worked on creating both the cultivated meat and plant-based meat sector, actually the cultivated foods and plant-based food sector. I used to do partnerships with the organization, do all sorts of interesting things, building up the sector for the organization. And that's where I really came upon the the topic that we're going to be discussing today, novel foods. And yeah, when, when I felt that I had sort of used up all the skills that I had and I desperately needed to, you know, have my own little personal renaissance and rediscover who I was, hone my skills and I like reinvent Ambika, I applied to Cambridge and uh, I did a second master's in public policy. And I think it was a life changing experience for me. And um, I sort of used all of the experience you know, all of the things that I'd learned over the 15 years of law, activism, policy, advocacy, wearing all of those hats, and of course, all the fantastic things that I learned at Cambridge. And I now advise companies within the cellular agriculture space on regulatory policy and build strategic partnerships for them. um, Yeah, so that's who I am. That's my life story. And that's it. Amika, that is a very nice thing to say. You said that uh, when you have used up all your skills and you wanted to, you know, reinvent yourself, you went to Cambridge. I mean, I'm I'm pretty sure many student recruiters of at least the judge should be using that quote. But I will move on to the topic of our podcast, and we've had several podcasts on the new food and alternative foods, and so many of our audience are familiar with the categories. I'll jump in right now and say. Plant-based food does not generally have to go through strict regulatory approval unless they use genetically modified organisms, like, for example, in the hemoglobin case. So I'm puzzled as to if plant-based food does have a short of time in the market, why bother at all about the cellular meat and dairy, which is where you're working in? So, you know, it's super interesting when we talk about plant-based foods. There are so many facets to to the entire plant-based industry like plant-based meats for example they reduce water consumption by 99 percent in comparison to regular meat the plant-based industry is really growing it's a one billion dollar industry in the uk it's eight billion dollar industry in the u.s demand for plant-based foods has gone up 21 percent from 2020 to 2022 so i mean the industry is growing it's getting more exciting 
Amsterdam has recently, you know, the city started talking about having more plant-based initiatives. The Danish government uh, is actually working with chefs and like nudging people to eat more plant-based. So there's a lot of movement. In India, for example, we've got our national millet mission where we're encouraging people to use millets and other products like that. So yeah, plant-based foods are fantastic. But I mean, there is also place, I think, for cultivated meat, for self-cultivated dairy, because A, people have a lot to these foods. When we talk about food, food just isn't about nutrition. For someone like me, food is about nutrition. I can eat the same thing every single day. But that isn't how it is for majority of the population. Food is something that families like to break bread or People eat a certain type of food during Christmas. When when we fall sick, we think of like comfort food, the food that like our grandmas made, our mums made. You know, there's a reason why as populations keep getting richer, they want to consume more and more meat because meat is viewed as an aspirational food. You know, I, I was just at COP28 and this was the first time there was a world, there was like a food day at COP. It was the last day of COP, but hey, you know what? At least there was a food day. It was incredibly exciting. And you know, often the narrative that I hear, particularly in the global north, is like, oh my God, India is getting rich. Oh my God, China is getting rich. They, you know, they're going to be consuming more and more meat. But I want to turn around and say, hey, is it so bad that the global south is getting rich and we want to have a sort of higher quality of life? And what I think is the issue, A, we should stop perceiving this as a bad thing in climate dialogue and in everywhere, any other place where this is coming up. And we should start thinking that what we really need is for innovation to match up to this demand. And the truth is, is that today we consume 350 million tons of meat. It's 14% of GHG emissions. That is more than every plane, train and car on the planet. By 2050, we are going to be consuming 570 million tons of meat. So that's twice as high from what it was in 2008. And the thing is, is that the meat demand continues to increase. Well, I'm a vegan. I've been vegan for 15 years, so there's no meat demand coming from me. I've also been an ardent advocate for animal rights, <laughs> so there's no way I'm part of this issue. But the thing is that this is what the trajectory is. And so what we need to do is we need to innovate. We need to innovate with plant-based meats. We need to innovate with the cellular agriculture. We need to find a way to create blends where you've got plant-based and you've got animal-based products and we need to start producing them. We need to employ nudges. You know, we need to get all of like the Michelin star chefs in these fancy restaurants putting these foods out as aspirational foods. Ambika, we know that food quality needs to be regulated. So what are the things that regulators are concerned about in the cellular proteins industry? Jerry, the thing is that when we talk about cellular agriculture, this is a novel food. This is a food that has never been consumed before. So regulators are really concerned about the health and the safety of their populations. They want to be sure that when they're putting something out, it is in fact safe for people to consume, that there won't be any side effects, that people won't fall sick. I think that's really the, the key concern that regulators are motivated by, to make sure that people, that these products do not affect anyone's health in any way in short term or in the long term. Ambika, what you said earlier was very interesting. You said uh, meat consumption is increasing rapidly and that we need more innovation in this area. Am I right in surmising that what you are saying is that plant-based meat really cannot meet the demands of people who actually eat meat? Not people like you, but many others in the world. So I think plant-based meats are great, but I think that there is a demand for animal meat. And I think that's where the cellular agriculture innovation comes in. And as I mentioned earlier, there is also the possibility of creating blends, you know, where you have plant-based ingredients that are incredibly meaty, incredibly nutritious, and you blend them with animal cells and uh, cultivated meat, and you have a beautiful blend. These are the kind of innovations that are important because whether we like it or not, there is a demand for real animal meat. So, of course, the plant-based foods are great and they take us up to a point. And I think cellular agriculture is great and it will help push the needle. Push the needle much further along. I understand that. 
Amika, as we were preparing for this podcast, I've heard you tell me that Singapore, the United States and Netherlands are taking the lead among countries in setting up these regulatory processes. Is that still true? Yes, of course. So it's not just Singapore, the US, the Netherlands. In fact, the UK is also a fantastic example. I'm just going to keep it very brief and tell you a little bit about each country. So within Singapore, it's an island nation which imports 90% of its food. And uh, they've got an incredibly ambitious and exciting plan, which is their 30 by 30 vision, where they want to produce 30% of their food locally by 2030. Now, there isn't place to farm, is there? Which is why you can easily grow meat or milk in a bioreactor, which is why the novel foods space, you know, diversifying their protein sources. This is all a goal that they have within their 30 by 30 mission. And they have invested 144 million to make this 30 by 30 vision a reality. I mean, there's the proof is in the pudding. Novel Foods companies um, received over, I'm going to say, $160 million in funding in 2022 alone. So, yes, there is one cultivated meat company that has gotten regulatory approval in Singapore. Singapore is incredibly efficient, so it takes 9 to 12 months to get regulatory approval there. In the U.S., there are two companies that have gotten regulatory approval. One is Upside Foods and the other one is Good Meats, both cultivated chicken companies. And there's an Israeli company that's gotten regulatory approval as well called Aleph Farms in Israel. And they're using 3D printing to make cultivated steak. Within the Netherlands, it's absolutely really, really interesting for me because at COP28, I heard one of the Dutch ministers say that the Netherlands is a food exporter and we will continue to innovate, hit our net zero targets and be- and continue to be a food exporter, which is why they've invested over 60 million to to create an ecosystem around cellular agriculture. So it's very exciting. I'd also like to bring the issue home to the UK, where there not only has there been government investment, but there are some fantastic ways that the UK is supporting the sector. For starters, there's an Innovate UK grant of 16 million for companies. There is also a 12 million grant that has been given to the University of Bath to deal with scaling challenges for the cultivated food sector. And then to add to it, um, the Food Standards Agency, they've launched a whole new website in which they're helping companies that want to apply for regulatory clearance for novel foods. So anybody who is listening to this podcast will realize how much Ambika knows about this area, the easy way with which she reels up her statistics. What you've learned so far is that innovation has to continue in this space. While we understand countries like Singapore, which does not grow any food to take the regulatory lead, it is obviously surprising and interesting to know that the Netherlands, which is a food exporter, is also taking the lead because they just want to remain a food exporter, even though they will hit net zero goals. This is a fantastic beginning to the podcast. And I think what we'll get on to the next phase is to understand the processes of regulatory approval. Ambika, the thing that fascinates me is how regulation needs to support innovation. In fact, you know, I've written a book about that. Give us an insight into what happens in the room when companies and regulators meet in this space. I just want to start by saying that I have read all of Jaydeep's books and they're absolutely fantastic. And I recommend them to anyone who's listening, and especially if you're a student of public policy. Now, onto the question. So, you know, it's really interesting when in this space, so I've actually spoken to almost every regulator in the world that is looking into like the novel foods regulation. And the one thing that I find is that they're very open, like they make it very clear, they're like, hey, come to us talk to us. Because the truth is, the space is evolving. The Singapore Food Agency, they even actually have this written on their website in black and white that we may need to change regulations from time to time as the sector evolves and as more information comes to light. I can actually like give you a little example of what it's like in the UK when a company applies and what stages it goes through. When a company approaches a regulator, there are a lot of, you know, initial questions that they iron out. So, you know, what kind of product is the company making? What are their processes? Each regulator, you know, there's like a way to ask questions where companies can ask questions. First of all, a lot of the regulatory agencies have actually put out very self-explanatory dossiers 
which are incredibly user friendly as i mentioned the uk is read on the side singapore has you know an, an entire sop you can also write to the sfa and ask them questions so what really happens in these meetings is that a company would say write to them and say hey i've got these questions and then the regulator would do their best to answer them you know even the food standards agency in uh, australia and new zealand uh, when when i contacted them and i spoke to them they also wrote back with the same response say hey we're here and we're open to answering questions what's also really interesting is that Australia and New Zealand and in the US they have shared drafts of previous applications on their website so you know companies even have something to follow so i i think it's just like a sort of standard government meeting but the only thing is that it's a really exciting new space so i think the regulators are kind of more excited to be dealing with this because you know you, they're kind of making history so you know when you send a query and even if the website says hey you're going to get a response in 2 weeks you get one the next day in australia and new zealand that said that you know you typically need to wait 6 weeks to get a response i got one on day 3 with uh, the email address and all of the details and the person said please write back to me and i'll answer all of your questions as best i can i think it's a very exciting space where there's excitement both from the side of the companies and the regulators because they're making history jadeep this reminds me a little bit about the chapter in your book how governments should be indeed there are links there and that's partly because ambika has read the book <laughs> you do like to tell our audience a little bit about just a snippet of the chapter well i was making the point in that chapter that regulators have a very important role to play because on the one hand they need to nurture these innovations which could have positive transformational impacts but they also have to be careful that they ensure protection of consumers like ambika was saying with the if you're talking about cellular meat and proteins we have to be careful about the health impacts nutritional impacts safety issues so there's a trade off and the only way to deal with that is for regulators to be proactive to go in there early and engage with all the innovators to get data from them and learn what the issues are so that they can regulate in a smart way nurture the innovation but also protect consumers and society exactly Ambika, take us a little bit behind the process of getting approval. Companies have to apply, and I understand it takes six to nine months. In the UK, you said it takes a little bit longer. What happens during that period? I understand this, the beginning. You write a few emails and you get a few questions, but how does the whole process work? So you know, I was thinking that for this answer, maybe I could take everyone through what happens in the UK, and I, I think the government in the UK has actually done a really good job of of you know throwing the gates open and making sure that the information is easily available. It's not you know difficult for companies to digest because you know one thing that we have to really be aware of is that all the companies in this space they're like they're young companies, they're startups. even the wealthiest ones have raised a few hundred million you know some of the younger companies that are already producing small samples of meat have only raised 1 or 2 million these these companies they don't have fancy food tech consultants and things like that so regulators need to be more open and be a little helpful and i think that's what the uk has has done quite well the process in the uk takes about 17 months there are three parts to the application the first part is all of the administrative data the second part is all of the tests that they need a company to do provide details of the process what is the source what are the cell lines that they've used the, the allergenicity the toxicity you know these are all like the important questions. questions that need to be answered and part 3 is sort of you know more scientific tests and things like that and the process when they're going through the application also is kind of like a three part process in which like the first part they kind of just look over all of the validate all of the information that's there and then after that there's like a risk assessment period for 9 months and they're really going through everything and assessing the risks and then after that there's sort of like a 7 month risk management period and their deliberations with the companies they also have a single point of contact so you know you kind of know who within the government they know that you know who is the government representative who's got the papers company can always reach out ask for a query ask for an update ask a question and the government gets back what's also great is that during this deliberation period you know when they're sort of looking through things very often in countries like the eu for example there is this start stop mechanism where they stop the clock on the time because they need a couple of more tests to be done or they need a couple of 
question and answer. So there is conversations that go on with the company. And and I think that's kind of like going back to Jaydeep's book where there's, you know, where, where they talk about like frugal innovation, one of the things that they really talk about is agility. And I think that's what's needed in this sector. Both the companies need to be agile, regulators need to be agile. And that's really what goes on. Ambika, that's interesting and just makes me so tempted to ask you more questions. I understand the initial phase, administrative data, you know, where the company is regulated, how, where the company is located, who the management is, and so on and so forth. I suppose that's the type of administrative data that you're talking about. And then the test data, which is, as you said, where the what is being produced, how is it being produced. And then there's risk evaluation, you said, and risk management. You have to tell us what these steps are all about. So it's kind of interesting, right? Like you submit all of the tests that the company has done, the regulator goes through all of these tests, all of the information that they have received, everything from like the source of the cell lines, the type of bioreactor that's been used, the cell culture media that was used. I mentioned all of the safety assessment tests and then they sort of evaluate that, hey, what risk could there be, if at all? And then they try and and see if that risk can be mitigated. So the UK, interestingly, has only received one application from a company called Aleph Farm. And it was around the middle of last year. When you ask me, like, what is this last risk management period? What is it like? I can't really even give you an answer because they haven't even gotten there themselves. But I can tell you that, like, in Singapore, for example, I know because when I spoke to the regulators themselves, and interestingly, one of the regulators from the Singapore Food Agency actually is a ex-Cambridge graduate. You know, when I spoke to him and I asked him, like, hey, what do you do during this time? His answer was very simple. His answer was like, every Every process is novel. So we evaluate the process, we evaluate all of the tests, we have certain benchmarks, and then they feel that that's going to be safe for human consumption. And then they go ahead and give the approval. They also have like a sort of novel working group, and then they kind of take things up to their novel working group and then their novel working group sort of studies it and sees that hey is there this this particular question that seems a bit challenging how they can answer that what additional evidence the company needs to provide for them to go ahead and give that regulatory approval so it's interesting because there's only four companies i think in different parts of the world that have gotten regulatory approval for this one in israel one in singapore two in the united states all i know is that you know, this is the process, these are the things that they need. And I also think what's really interesting is that they're going to be thoughts that that they're going to have at that point of time when they're evaluating that that may not even have been anticipated, which is why there's a start stop. So, you know, you can stop the clock and say, hey, we need these additional tests. So sometimes the companies haven't even thought about what is needed. Absolutely. We might want to get in touch with our Cambridge alum friend of yours in Singapore. But I wanted to go back to the previous point that you made about these. Many of these companies are early stage companies, right? And at the same time, regulators are encouraging these companies to get in touch with them when they're even developing their product. Aren't companies a little cagey about this sometimes? I actually think that there are also like a couple of nonprofits that are doing a really good job. So the Good Food Institute, for example, they really share a lot of their data, you know, on regulatory policy, on how to get regulatory approval, all of their insights from different countries. So they sort of share all of these things with the companies. Cellular Agri in Australia has actually made for, I think, a few thousand dollars, they've actually made an entire resource available, almost like an SOP for companies to apply for regulatory approval. So companies may not even need to get any sort of external advice. And then, you know, there's also a cellular agri in in Europe where, you know, all of the companies have come together and they're sort of sharing resources and they're collaborating So I don't think companies are really cagey about going to regulators, but I do think that there's more that regulators can do to help companies. And what they've done is great, but I think there's a little more that's needed. You know, we talk of regulators as if they're one uniform entity when in fact they're not. Can you tell us a little bit about the different regulatory bodies or even within a body, the different teams or the different opinions or interests that are involved? So, yeah, Jelly, you're absolutely right. When you deal with countries like Singapore and Israel, it's very easy because, you know, they're much smaller teams. But when you're dealing with, say, the EU, 
it's pretty massive because there is the EFSA, which is, you know, their, their food regulatory authority, which kind of looks into novel food applications, receives the application. But then after that, you know, once EFSA said, hey, this, this, this is good to go, it goes to the European Commission. And the European Commission has a standing committee on plants, animals, food, and feed. Within this committee, there is representation from each one of the EU countries. And the decision-making process there is quite complicated. So they sort of adopt uh, an opinion based on a qualified majority voting system, where at least 55% of the member states, representing at least 65% of the EU population, need to vote for something to pass. You know, you're absolutely right in saying that we can't clump regulators in into one group. And there are different bodies that are, you know, playing interesting roles in, in this space. So we know within the European Union, while EFSA, which is the food regulator, has several um, consultations and workshops. And I attended one of the EFSA workshops where they came on for about an hour and they actually explained step by step how companies need to apply for regulatory approval. Companies were also given the opportunity to ask questions. And then the next day you read in the newspapers that Italy is trying to ban all kind of cellular agriculture in that country. So so you're absolutely right. It, it is an, an interesting animal and there are many forces at play you know i'm just wondering what happens now that these companies have got approval what are the things that they have to work on now doing all those usual things getting the product to the market and then getting customers to buy it you know even before we get to customers buying it we really need is to be able to scale the products Yes, there are companies that have gotten regulatory approval. And of course, there are these kind of pop-ups or restaurants where they may have a tasting, where, you know, cultivated meat products may be sold, where, you know, even when I was at, at COP, there was a company from uh, from South Africa headed up by my friend Tasneem and, you know, the Africa's only cultivated meat company. And they did a tasting with meatballs for about 20 people. There are loads of these like sort of pop-ups where people go in and they try it. But unfortunately, because no company has really been able to scale cultivated meat it it isn't available in the market because once the company has got regulatory approval there are enough and more people that are extremely keen to try cultivated meat i think scaling is really the issue that that comes in the company's way at this point of time and how long do you think it'll take for the manufacturing process to be scaled which is what i think you're referring to I mean, I think it's going to take more like five to seven years, maybe, because even the equipment right now, when I talk to my friends who are scientists who are really building out the tech, they're currently using farmer grade equipment and they should be using custom bioreactors for cell cultivated meat or cell cultivated dairy. And they're still in the process of sort of developing these bioreactors themselves. So it's a really interesting thing because we're like trying to develop the tech and we're trying to commercialize and we're doing this all at the same time. So, you know, I, I love to give people this example. We are basically exactly where renewables was in the 1980s, where everyone's like, oh my God, this is a fantastic idea. There are people working on it. There are some governments that are excited. There are some governments that are not excited. There are some groups that are keen. There are some groups that are a little nervous, but there are going to be tech challenges. And I, and I think this is why the sector needs more patient capital and more more uh, government support. So speaking of government support, besides regulation, what can governments do to play a more supportive role in promoting these innovations? Jerry, thanks for that question. I think like that's kind of the stage that we're at right now. This is the most important thing. So there's been like approximately three billion of dollars of vc investment in the sector which is amazing but what the sector needs is sort of more centers you know where bioreactors are available there's more funding so all of the easy sort of entry levels research problems pain points that companies had some of that data and that information should be open source i mean i guess that's why the uk gave a 12 million grant to the university of Bath to really deal with these scaling challenges i think what's also interesting is that innovate uk is giving a lot of funding in in a very smart way so there's a company called extra cellular and they received a grant from innovate uk where to make cell lines these are available at very low costs it's license free the cell bank for license free 
free, companies can actually buy these very inexpensive cell lines to develop their cultivated meat products. And then this came from an Innovate UK grant in which Extracellular, the company that was developing the cell lines and Maltus, a company that makes the media these companies got together and they did this with Innovate UK funding. And these are the kind of really amazing examples that we need to replicate all over the world. I mean, like what the Dutch government is doing where they're giving 60 million, plus they're working with their local companies and they're trying to create infrastructure. Then they also have 25 million co-funding sort of co-financing scheme where they're helping companies out. I think these are the kind of things that we need. So policy doesn't just need to say, hey, we've got like a friendly regulatory environment in a couple of countries and in a couple of countries we don't like you. It's not a very friendly regulatory environment. I think What needs to happen is the countries really need to put something in to make this happen, you know, because when, you know, the statistic that I was like really keen on giving you guys is that if by 2035, the novel foods, if we use the protein from novel food and the novel foods proteins occupy 11% of the total protein that is consumed, we will save on emissions to such a great extent that we will be able to decarbonize the entire aviation industry. Now, if we let that sit with us for a minute, think about, I mean, it is just such a massive figure to be looking at. And I I remember when I was at Cambridge, we studied um, about like biological innovation and then we studied about like ecosystem services and all of these great concepts. And when I think about this, like, If we understood the value of that one acre of virgin rainforest in Brazil that is raised to the ground for cows to to graze on, if we put a value on that, our governments would be smarter and they would invest more money into this sector. And that's what we need. We need governments to invest more money into the sector fund startups, but fund startups smartly, like the, like what they've done with this company, you know, where you where they get to keep their IP, they also get to innovate, scientists are adequately incentivized, but at the same time, you know, products are available for companies to be able to research and to be able to really develop this sector. So that's what's really needed. And I think what's really also needed is perhaps a PhD in Cambridge who does like a cost benefit <laughs> analysis that we can take and show to government saying, hey, you want to hit these ambitious net zero targets you want to reduce methane emissions from food this is your solution with the vc funding and with the scientists ingenuity we've been able to take it up to here and now we need big government support to really make it all happen i think the point that you made about protecting rainforest if you had a price for rainforest which countries would have to contribute to something like what brazil has proposed in the last cop perhaps there would be more incentive for cell-based food. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Yeah, 100%. If we just understood how expensive, what the value of these forests are in financial terms and governments could translate that and find a way to invest more into cellular agriculture, they would be saving a huge amount of resources because like I said, you know, when we talk about plant-based meats, they use 99% less water. Cultivated meat uses 66% less water. You know, when we talk about conventional beef and then sort of the beef that would be made in a lab. If we produce cultivated meat using renewable energy, we can reduce the carbon footprint of beef by up to 92% and pork by up to 44%. When we're talking about land use, cultivated meat reduces the land that is used. So like 90% less land is used uh, in comparison to beef that's available today. 60% less land is used in comparison to the pork that's available today. And 64% when it comes to the chicken that's available today. So we're saving on land, we're saving on water, we're saving on energy so we're saving on all of these resources all in all it is such a fantastic solution i mean even the plant-based foods they're such fantastic solutions and if governments just sort of understood the economic argument and um if somebody could really put this into a coherent argument so going back to like the just transition I mean, there are going to be farmers who are going to lose livelihoods. And uh, this is one of the really interesting things that happened, uh, you know, that, that we talk about at Sinara as well, which is why we're very keen on engaging with dairy farmers. So, of course, there is some cows that will be needed for the milk. But in addition to that, you know, to, to provide the cells for the milk. But, you know, we could keep the existing supply chains the way that they are. 
So the farmers keep doing the job that they do. It's just that instead of getting the milk from an animal, they're getting it from a bioreactor. And I think that so governments need to be mindful and have policies like this, where we really do what we can to ensure that no jobs are lost because of this novel sector. I mean, when we talk about like the big meat companies, a lot of the big meat companies, you know, Tyson, Cargill, all of these guys, they have invested in cultivated meat companies. Um, they've even gone so far as to refer to themselves as sort of protein producing, protein manufacturing companies. Big industry will adapt. But what we need to do is governments need to a, regulate the sector, keeping health and safety in mind, but also be open to startups, fund public infrastructure where startups can really grow. They can sort of get better and they can, they can really bring that, you know, scale up their products, bring it to market. And lastly, we should ensure that no one's left behind, especially not farmers, because I mean, I feel like the farmers always get an incredibly raw deal. But I think this sector can really help give them a really good deal because livestock is hard to depend on. You know, animals fall sick, there are zoonotic diseases, there's all these health and safety regulations. If there are ways that we could actually engage the same people, but within the supply chain, we've got a fantastic solution. We've got a window here. This isn't coming on our plates tomorrow, but in seven, eight, ten years, it's going to be here. So we've got this time when the scientists are developing the tech. The government should be thinking about ways that farmers can get other jobs. We've come to the end of the podcast. I'm going to ask you a question. Tell us about your daily job. I mean, you're a lawyer, right? So I can understand what you do in some ways because I've worked with IP patent lawyers. You are sort of in a meticulous and in writing the forms and the documents and so on and so forth. But you must be working, you know, side by side, Zoom call by Zoom call with scientists, right? Tell us a little bit about how your daily one day in a work life goes. So, you know, I used to do everything from like gathering the data on the field to like filing my own petitions, whether it was in the Supreme Court or in the High Court. So I did all the pretty things, all the ugly things. In fact, I spent all of 2017 in slaughterhouses and in factory farms, which is why I'm also so motivated to be in this sector because, you know, I realized that it's a massive problem and this is a good solution that can solve this problem. So I never had that life as a lawyer. But currently, you know, my, my role with Sonara, I look into all of the regulatory aspects. I help with, you know, grants and sort of like lots of the other interesting things that come with, with working with a startup. Up. And before this, I worked with a start in Cambridge, Cellcraft, and they were doing cultivated meat. And my role was similar there. It was sort of like legal, regulatory, looking into grants, you know, helping the team and all. Even startups are very all hands on deck. So I do a little bit of everything. So, yes, I do spend a lot of time with scientists trying to figure out what exactly they're doing. People. So, yeah, it is the learning curve is quite steep because, you know, you're, you're talking about regulating something you don't really know how it's made. So, yeah, I'm always talking to scientists. I'm always learning. I think it's a dynamic environment and we're doing something impactful and we're changing the world in a good way. So, yeah, there's nothing I wouldn't do to make it happen. Uh, thank you very much. We'll just take a few things from what you said. It is obviously important to first acknowledge that four companies have got approval in the cellular meat and dairy industry, all in cellular meat, compared to the progress that one has made in the plant-based meat. But investment in cellular meat, according to Ambika, is absolutely critical to wean a growing and growing rich population of the real thing, or maybe this will be the real thing in a decade or so from now. Regulators need to be proactive, as Jadeep said, in working with companies. They need to understand that technologies will change. They need to understand that companies may take time to come up with the results and the answers to their questions, because not all companies are very well funded. As long as the process is transparent and companies and regulators are working together, there should be a positive outcome. But regulation is just one aspect of what is required for an industry like this to grow. It has grown on the, on the backs of private capital, as Ambika mentioned, but investment in basic R&D, investment in common manufacturing processes, and perhaps nudging things to be open source, because this is food, would help in actually propagating the innovation to make a real impact. Now, finally, I think the point that, Ambika, you made about 
using this time, it is actually a good thing that that cellular meat will take, you know, maybe five to seven years to come to our shelves. But using this time to make sure that people have alternate livelihoods ready for the change is probably an important thing. And it's probably an important thing in the context of a lot of the artificial intelligence discussions that we are seeing today. Ambika, do you have any questions for us? Jaydeep, will you take on any PhD in to do what I said? Like maybe if they could come on and they could kind of do an economic analysis and they could show the world like how good this is for, for the environment, like in money terms. Would you do that? Yeah, great idea. I mean, and it doesn't even have to be a PhD. Something like this could be done by a master's student as a master's thesis. We could get several students to work on these kinds of questions. In fact, there probably already are students working on these questions, not just in the business school, but right across the university. There is so much interest at the moment in all these different aspects of sustainability, particularly around food and the food system. So that's a great thought, Ambika, and I suspect that a lot is already happening in this space. Sanjay, I have a question for you as well. Please. What is it that motivates you about food? What is it like? What has made you make these podcasts about food and climate? Well, I'm interested in the topic of climate change. This is what I, I've been working around for 14 years. The topic around food, in my opinion, is important because, you know, there is likely to be a negative impact. Several of our podcasts, we already see impacts of climate change and food security, for example, in Africa. You know, Amika, I do have to say that at an age in life where I have seen people talk about famine, where I have seen people talk about severe food insecurity. My grandfather was growing up at a time in India when we had the Bengal famine. So it, it is heard about is something that I kind of understand, which perhaps younger people may not quite appreciate. Wow, thank you so much for sharing that answer. I just want to say thank you to you both for caring enough about this topic, for making this podcast, for giving me this opportunity to talk about it and for being a part of, of the solution. Ambika, if people have to get in touch with you, how should they? I mean, LinkedIn is a really great way. I, I accept almost every request I get and try and answer as many questions as I can. I get back to everyone who reaches out to me, so I would always say that LinkedIn is the best way to reach out to me. With that, thank you very much, Ambika. It was a very interesting conversation. We learned a lot. Your passion is so, so clear. Thank you so much, Ambika. Indeed, I echo everything Sanjay said. Thank you so much, Guy. Thank you, Sanjay. Thank you, Jadeep.